Hey everybody, welcome to another Machiavellian Monday here on Bully Whispers, formerly Soprano Street, and we are here today to evaluate the answer to the question, how Machiavellian was Big Paul Castellano? As someone who spent many years under Carlo Gambino, and eventually became boss of the Gambino family himself, it would be very easy to assume that he was, but this is not necessarily the case. For viewers new to the series, Machiavellianism is much more specific than just the general notion of being an effective schemer and that the ends justify the means. The Prince is essentially a how-to-rule manual for current or aspiring leaders, detailing the most effective ways to deal with specific circumstances and different types of people based on Machiavelli's historical observation. It is held in very high regard by the Mafia, and is even known to have been referenced by Big Paul's mentor, Carlo Gambino. So, how Machiavellian was Paul Castellano? In evaluating the answer to this question, we will first take a look at his general personality before digging into the role good fortune played in his rise, the lessons he failed to learn from that good fortune, how he strayed from the Machiavellian path, how even when he didn't stray it came back to bite him, and ultimately, how he became a great example of Machiavellianism in action, even if it wasn't always him that was pushing in that direction. When evaluating his personality in general, we will first start by addressing his level of boldness. For Machiavelli said that, with a few exceptions, good fortune is like a woman, a lover of men with the audacity to command her, and Big Paul was quite bold. And he certainly wasn't shy about voicing his dissatisfaction if his Christmas present wasn't big enough, if the envelope wasn't thick enough. In this particular case, however, his type of boldness would be one of the few exceptions Machiavelli was referring to, and Big Paul's good fortune would come in different forms, but we will get back to that in a bit. The other aspect of his personality that we will take a look at is his intellect. According to Machiavelli, there are three types of intellect, the lowest of which, the third level, is incapable of understanding either on their own or through showing of others. While some may half-sarcastically remark that he belongs in that group due to the many lessons he failed to learn from Carlo Gambino, more realistically, he fell between the first and second levels. The second level, which is capable of understanding what others show them, is pretty much a given due to the simple fact that he lasted as long and made it as high as he did. Someone with a complete inability to understand would never be able to do this regardless of to whom they are related. Beyond that, Big Paul's ability to comprehend is what made him useful to Gambino, all became a capo and a key player in the boss's plan to develop the so-called white rackets. And also what set him apart from the average gangster in the family. And of course, you know, that didn't go over with the meat and potatoes thieves, you know, down at the bottom because they didn't know how to do that. The first level is someone who is able to understand on their own, and a case can be made for him to be considered on this level due to his prowess on the business side of things. However, he appears to demonstrate a lack of awareness, specifically in regards to situation and perception. This lack of awareness played a large role in his downfall and would be inconsistent with Machiavelli's first level of intelligence, leaving Big Paul in what would probably be considered the upper portion of the second level. While Paul's intelligence certainly didn't hinder his rise and probably even helped it, his ascension seems to be sparked primarily by several instances of good fortune. First, his father introduced him to both running a legitimate business through his butcher shop and the underworld since he ran the local lottery. Second, even though his father wasn't a heavyweight, the Castellano family was respected enough to bring over and help out Paul's third and by far most significant torrent of good fortune, his cousin Carlo Gambino. To be fair, Big Paul did a few things of his own accord during his rise, which did help his reputation. When he and some of his friends robbed a clothing store as teenagers and he was arrested, he refused to give their names and served a short time in prison for it. Similarly, he served time for contempt after refusing to answer questions regarding the infamous meeting in Appalachian, New York, at which he was one of the gangsters arrested. That being said, and his teenage foray into robbery aside, he was never really considered to be a street guy, which was reflected in his reputation after Gambino named him successor. So when Castellano became Don in 1976, Many saw him as someone who rose to the top because of his relationship with Gambino, not because he had paid his dues on the street. So at this point, from a Machiavellian perspective, he is the leader of an area with long-standing aristocracies, which would be similar to the mob, and he came to power via the nobles, specifically Carlo Gambino and Neil Della Croce, as opposed to attaining power via the people. Quick side note, I included De La Croce as a noble who was responsible for his power because if he hadn't been such a good sport about being passed over and decided to fight Big Paul, at the very least a lot of damage would have been done to Paul's crew and there's a decent chance he would have beaten Paul outright. Let me know who you think would have come out on top down in the comments. 
Either way, according to Machiavelli, when taking over this type of entity, under these circumstances, the most important thing for a prince is to not rock the boat, so to speak, and here we see him do one thing well, and one thing terribly. From a Machiavellian perspective, a wise prince takes good advice, and this is exactly what Big Paul did by keeping Della Croce as an underboss. Not only did this keep peace from a practical standpoint, it also put the perfect person in the right spot according to the prince. Della Croce was an almost textbook perfect number two, however, his extreme effectiveness in that capacity may have enabled Paul to drift further away from the Machiavellian path, but we will get back to that. The other thing that Big Paul did was to raise taxes within the Gambino family. Castellano has to rule. From now on, I get 15%. And here we see two Machiavellian principles working against him. The worst thing a prince can be viewed as is a violator of his people's property. As everybody said, wait a minute, this guy is making money like it's going out of style. What has he got to chisel another couple of dollars? And an extension of not rocking the boat, which is to keep taxes the same. This idea is doubled down on in a more specific manner later in the book when Machiavelli explains that it is especially important for a prince who came to power via the nobles because he will need to win over the people to be successful in the long run. And he was not off to a good start. This issue was also intensified due to a lesson Big Paul failed to learn from Carlo Gambino. Unlike his predecessor Carlo Gambino, who had lived modestly, Big Paul, as he was called, lived ostentatiously. This was bad for Paul from a Machiavellian standpoint for several reasons. First, a prince's fortress can be a good thing as long as it doesn't cause resentment from the people, but in this instance it did. Its huge size and ostentatious style would be a visible reminder of the extra money he was taking out of their pockets, and the fact that he made everyone go there to meet him would make it a constant reminder as well. Second, the fact that he made everyone go to Staten Island to meet with him led to him having neither as strong of a presence in the streets, nor as clear of an understanding of what goes on there as he should have. According to Machiavelli, a prince must be on the spot so he can see trouble early, and Big Paul had isolated himself. But he was able to get away with it for a while due to Della Croce's ability to keep the blue collar wing in check. Had Della Croce not been as effective, Big Paul may have been forced to keep more of a street presence, but we will never know. Lastly, by having his meetings in his house, this brought his maid and mistress Gloria Larte under heavy scrutiny from both law enforcement and other gangsters. From a practical standpoint, the attention from law enforcement was obviously bad and the FBI eventually learned where in Castellano's house to place the bug. Paul's lover, Gloria Alarte, unwittingly provided the answer over a cup of coffee with the FBI agent who had befriended her. From a Machiavellian standpoint, the attention Gloria was getting from other mobsters was atrocious. According to the prince, a leader must always be careful of appearances and in all actions should seek to have the appearance of a great man. He was fucking around with his mate. This is not something we do. While having women on the side is accepted, if not expected, in the mob life, it was also expected that you show respect to your wife. This is a lesson that Carlo Gambino taught Tato, which Paul would have been well off to learn, when Tato showed an indifference that may have disrespected his wife. Do you love your wife? Of course, of course, Paul, I do love my wife. Let me ask you something, Tato. Do you love me? Of course, Carl, of course I love you. I hope you don't love me like you love your wife. And this was for an incident that was much less direct and severe than the blatant disrespect that Paul was regularly showing to his wife. The fifth Cadillac in the garage is a big fucking garage. Is glorious. And Gloria dictates to his wife now. Not only that, but since everyone had to go to Paul's house to meet, everyone got to see it. As if this wasn't enough, Big Paul was diabetic, which left him impotent, and his solution not only may have proved to be the straw that broke the camel's back at home. So he got a penile implant. His wife left him. Paul's affair with Gloria broke the mafia code of the sacredness of the home. But it also made its way around the Gambino family via the grapevine, and to a group of guys like that, this made him a bit of a joke. Their estimation of Paul Castellano as a man just plummeted. Either way, he was able to get away with it for a while, partially due to Neil Della Croce, his highly respected and feared underboss who was almost devout when it came to mafia rules. But then Della Croce died. At this point, Big Paul is a boss who came to power via the nobles and needs to win over the people, but unfortunately for him, the two nobles most responsible for his power, Gambino and Della Croce, were now both dead and the people didn't like him at all. 
Aside from being viewed as not having earned the position, his raising of taxes, his obliviousness to his reputation, his other missteps like the Westies, and his tremendous downgrade at the number two spot from Della Croce to Tommy Bellotti left him open to attack. When it comes to takeovers, Machiavelli states that a prince has two fears, threats from within and threats from the outside. From within, the prince states that the areas that have long-standing aristocracies are both easier to conquer and harder to hold for the same reason. It only takes one upset baron to open the door. This is a lesson Big Paul should have learned from his mentor Carlo Gambino, who had Albert Anastasia taken out in his own bid to move up, similar to how Frankie DeChico would switch over to Paul's main upset baron, John Gotti. Now, in and of itself, this doesn't mean disaster. For, as Machiavelli expresses, a prince who is highly esteemed is harder to conspire against because not only do the conspirators have to fear the act itself, but also the aftermath. Unfortunately for Big Paul, he wasn't particularly highly esteemed within the Gambino family. To make matters worse, he weakens his own position by having a lot of the people who would have inspired the fear of that aftermath, such as Nino Gaggi and Roy DeMeo, killed. The other aspect of the aftermath that any conspirators against Big Paul should have had to fear is retribution from the other four families. Depending on what book you're reading or documentary you're watching, it was either the Genovese and or Lucchese families that really had a problem with it. This is evidenced by the fact that they ordered a hit on Gotti, which killed Frankie DeChico instead, but not much else was done beyond that. Whether this was because the other families really didn't care that much, or they just weren't in a position to, is irrelevant when evaluating Paul from a Machiavellian perspective, since either way, Paul was relying too heavily on good laws and good fortune. Now, we've seen the role good fortune has played in Paul's life so far, from his rise via Carlo Gambino, to having such a good sport for an underboss in Della Croce. But in this particular instance, he was relying on the other families being in a position to retaliate, and on their obligation to do so under Mafia rules. According to Machiavelli, there are two ways of resolving conflict, through law and through arms. In this situation, Mafia law dictates that no boss be hit without permission, and if an attack is made, it is met with swift, decisive retaliation. Unfortunately, when dealing with people whose entire lifestyle is built upon breaking rules, expecting them to follow yours 100% of the time is rather unrealistic. So when laws fail, a prince must resort to arms which, between dividing and distancing himself from many of the street crews and the killing of many of his own top enforcers, Big Paul was not really in a good position to do. His firepower was dropping while the conspirators was rising at just the moment when Big Paul and the other boss's good fortunes were going south. Ultimately, as Machiavelli expressed, a prince can seem happy today and ruined tomorrow if relying on good fortune, which Paul was. And for him, tomorrow was December 16th, 1985. It was said he was the boss of bosses, Paul Castellano, gunned down on a crowded New York City street. Well, thanks for watching another Machiavellian Monday here on Bully Whispers. As always, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you at the next score.